Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 597. 597 of the Agostino Zynga show. I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may be finding you. I hope you are doing well. It's been a while since I last checked in with you crazy folk and I hope um, I haven't, you know, what's your quote, disappointed you some of you with my absence. I know I probably have, but I'm going to be back bigger than ever as I always promised to do um, just starting this week and just kind of looking at the content because I'll be away for a few days in the middle of September. So I'm going to make sure that I keep you guys fed and entertained during these um, months coming up or this these weeks coming up, especially, especially heading up into winter. Do you know what I mean, I need to make sure the content is out there nice and ripe so you guys have something to distract yourself from all the drudgery that's occurring outdoors but apart from that how have i been i've been fairly okay i'm not gonna lie um the training hasn't been going as consistently as i'd want it to be i've been going to gym like three times a week doing the whole fasting thing maybe four times a week not seven as i would like to do but as i've got this wedding coming up in three weeks i'm going to the middle of january so the middle of september i'm going to be doing a pretty aggressive weight cut so if you do see me looking a bit sickly and a bit hollow cheeked do not be concerned i'm not on crack cocaine um i'm not taking heroin or anything crazy like that i'm just going to be going on a crazy weight cut so i can just fit into a nice suit and then of course when i come back go back straight to normal again so a little bit of a yo-yo diet a little bit of a crash diet just to get me into a nice suit that i want to wear and then back to schedule scheduled programming so if you oh back to regular scheduled programming so i got a bit of the shorbinism creeping in there so if you do see me looking a bit gaunt do not be concerned all things are under control i'm just doing it for fashion just doing it for the look and if you've got any complaints oh, I guess you know it's not safe you should do it more of a healthier way sod those complaints put them to the side let me get my suit off let me get my look off let me get my little fun off for that one day and then we'll go back to normal after we've finished okay cool cool safe anyway what else I've been up to um over the weekend what did I do oh so over the weekend I had um work of course as per usual so that was took up a bit of my time but then I was also able to attend a rave over the weekend on Sunday that I'm obviously going to recap you about that later on but I went to start off first of all by mentioning something I noticed you know in my um gallivanting around town and interacting with certain people who run things certain people who are involved in certain scenes certain people who put on events certain people who may represent certain artists certain people who are just movers and shakers in whatever industry they're in and one thing I notice a lot especially in recent years that's incredibly different to how it was when I was doing it because you know when I was somewhat involved in a scene and also very visible um and also very active I generally didn't really let it define my personality. It wasn't something that I kind of wore um, like a medal, right? I didn't wear like a hat. I didn't wear like a jacket. I didn't have like a, um, you know, um, what's, what's that Baptist church that had those signs about, you know, really homophobic slurs and what they put them in little billboards. I didn't do all that sort of stuff. I just kind of did my thing. And if you saw me around, then you kind of knew what I was about. But for the most part, I didn't really shout it from the rooftops, apart from when I promoted my stuff that I was doing on my own social media page. But for the most part, everyday life you wouldn't really know what I was getting up to right I just tried to kind of be about the work but nowadays I guess because things are mostly social in terms of promotion in terms of branding in terms of marketing it would seem like the people who are involved now who are doing the work who are kind of continuing on this lineage of putting on great events who are continuing this lineage of you know being creative and trying to add their little notch to the creative timeline of this city or this world that we're living in it seems like a lot of them are very hell-bent on making sure you know who they are or making sure that they walk around so that you think or you know that they're somewhat important. It's a very strange and weird attitude, but I have noticed it as l lately anyway, and it's something that's been kind of bothering me a little bit because I never was like that. And I'm really thinking, maybe I missed a trick. Maybe I missed a trick not really being a bit up my own ass and actually believing. No, don't get me wrong. I always believe that I'm the shit. I always believe that I'm you know incredibly talented what I do or I'm incredibly capable I always believed that I was somewhat special you know sometimes you got delusion in you and that's my always delusion I've always believed I'm somewhat special so I've always believed that my success in whatever field that I do is somewhat inevitable it'll just be a far it'll just be a way more 
harder route to get to that level of success because for the most part well, for whatever reason my family and everything that we've kind of done everything has always come a bit hard to us it doesn't mean it's never happened but everything concerning my family my parents when they come to their career my brothers and what they got up to it's always come really really difficult it doesn't mean it never happens but it just has to we just have to kind of like claw away at it you know stomp our feet in the ground really hunker down for us to kind of get in level of success we don't usually get that beginner's luck or first time luck or someone brought you in it never happens like that for, for us and my family so I think that's something that's going to carry on with me so eventually I'll get to where I need to get to it's just going to take a bit longer than most people fine no problem but some people out there I feel like um, have this really I think somewhat outsized ego given what they do and they really go out of their way to be like I wouldn't even say obstinate. I don't know what you know what the what the term is. I wouldn't say it's rude either because again I don't know these people, so I can't say it's rude because who knows how I'm coming across that's making them react the way that they're reacting, who are, which is uh, which is what I'm responding to. But there is a certain attitude that exists. It's, maybe it's here, maybe it's just in general in the kind of cultural malaise or cultural atmosphere out there of just having an ego that's way outside of what you're actually doing, and an ego that I think in comparison to other people who have achieved far more, doesn't make any sense. And the reason why I bring this up is because, number one, of Virgil Abloh, RIP, to the GOAT. But the times that I met him, even when he was, I would say, when his personality wasn't as well refined as it was towards the end of his life, I feel like, you know, towards the end of his life, he, he came into his own and maybe was a bit more chill in general i don't know how to describe it but in the beginning when i first kind of met him in the middle beginning time stage he wasn't he didn't always come across the warmest let's just say that right but as he gained more success his personality became way more personable he became the every the every man right to everybody like everyone had a good experience uh, interaction with, everyone had a good experience with him when they interacted with him he'd go out of his way to be extra kind he'd always stop for autographs and pictures and stuff he went out of his way to really sort of like um buck against a trend of people who have got big jobs or are really big wigs in the industry and also being up their own asses but i also noticed virgil abloh aside that the higher up the person that you meet like imagine if you, you used to meet like a Carl Lagerford, R.I.P. the GOAT or like somebody else like a Tom Ford or like a Mark Jacobs usually those people are always the safest the actual people who are the creative minds behind these brands the creative people behind these you know agencies and labels whoever, whoever these people may be they're usually the nicest people it's the ones below them who are the cunts so it's the ones who are like the you know the assistant to the guy the I don't know, the receptionist to the office, to the studio, um, the area manager, whatever it may be, whatever level that's, uh, that exists below the C, the, the kind of, the, the, C, yeah, the founder, or the kind of visionary, the brand or the agency or the studio, those are usually the cunts. And I never really understood it because for the most part, you're just working a job. So this sense of entitlement that you have about something like that it doesn't make any sense because you're just an employee. And also relax. But sometimes I think to myself, maybe I miss a trick maybe that's what I should have been doing when I was doing my thing I should have had more of an outsized ego and maybe with that outsized ego people start to believe that you are who you think you are and then that allows you to get certain opportunities or allows you to open certain doors or put in certain position I don't really know I'm not really too sure that might be one of the things but sometimes I always think about Virgil and I think to myself but Virgil wasn't like that Virgil was the head of fucking Louis Vuitton menswear right one of the very rare black fashion designers out there heterosexual fashion designers had his own label was doing all these other multitude of things had every industry connected he wanted under if he's you know in his flipping black book but he was still amazingly safe and then you got some of these other people that i bump into and see in certain places who are just i don't know you're doing your thing don't get me wrong congratulations and you're putting on a great service and people are enjoying what you're doing and you're providing people with a respite or you're providing good work or whatever you're doing but it's not really like that level. You know what I mean, it's not like um, as what would say as Kanye would say. It's not Ralph level, but yet you've got the ego of a Ralph level of a Ralph Lauren, which makes no sense. But Ralph Lauren's really nice, so it's really odd. But then today, I found this clip actually randomly as I was thinking about it. It's weird how this happens, right? And this is courtesy of a website called David Bowie News, and I actually found this first of all via a tweet that someone posted out there about how David Bowie had a very interesting and somewhat enlightening perspective on life and everything and his celebrity and his stature and whatnot what he was coming up and i thought this story was incredibly funny and humorous but also spoke a lot to how i've been feeling about some people i've been interacting with and made me realize that actually 
the way people go on, how they some, can sometimes be rude and sometimes be a bit obstinate and just be a little bit difficult to deal with because they're doing a certain thing that they think is giving them the reason to be a cunt is not really the normal way to go about things. And actually the great way to go about things is to maybe adopt a more David Bowie um, perspective or POV on life and how to kind of, how you see yourself and to kind of have some level of humility. And once I play this video, you'll kind of understand what I mean. But this is a really cool little video. And this is courtesy of an account called Adam Buxton and it's titled David Bowie, Ashes to Ashes, Clown Suit Story. Hope you guys enjoy. Cut. Okay, everybody, let's reset. David, you got a two minute break. Tommy, let's get those girls. Hello, son. Don't suppose you got a spare Ziggy? Did you say a spare Ziggy? Yeah, you know, a smoke, a snout, a wibwob, a cigarette. Oh, right. Here you go. Much obliged. Uh, what was your name? Uh, Mike. Ah, uh, Mike. Check the mic. Don't wreck the mic. Back off on the mic. Oh, where's it? Where's it? Where's it? Where's it? So, here we are. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Bowie, what would you say was the biggest moment of your career? Oh, well, let me tell you about it, Mike. I had quite the attitude as a young pop star. Can I have tissues? My eyes, please. Yes, David. No, those are the wrong tissues. Oh, sorry, David. It's easy to get caught up in the hype. It changes you. So I was on the set of the music video for Ashes to Ashes. Do you know the one? Uh, yes, I do. Right, so we're on the beach, shooting the scene with a giant bulldozer. And over there, there's Steve Strange and various weirdos that we picked up at the Blitz Club in London the night before. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and David Mallet, the director, he's got the camera on a very long lens. And I'm dressed from head to toe in a clown suit. Why not? I hear playback and the music starts. So off I go. I start singing and walking. But as soon as I do, this old geezer with a dog walks right between me and the camera. Well, knowing this is going to take a while, I walk past the old guy and sit next to the camera in my full costume, waiting for him to pass. And as he's walking by the camera, David Mallet, pointing at me, says to him, Excuse me, sir, do you know who this is? The old guy looks at me from bottom to top, and he looks back at David Mallet and says, Course I do, it's some cunt in a clown suit. That was a huge moment for me, Mike. It put me back in my place. It made me realise, yes, I am just a cunt in a clown suit. And basically, we're all cunts in clown suits, right? To some degree. And I guess in the grand scheme of things, nothing that we do is really that important. Nothing that we do kind of really should give you an excuse to be a dick to people or to be rude or to come across cold or whatever it may be, especially if they're there enjoying the thing that you do. Just a bizarre attitude to have. But in general, no one really deserves to have that kind of level of ego if somebody as talented and as um, ephemeral and as awe-inspiring and as legendary as David Bowie didn't have that level of ego, then I don't think somebody doing the things I see on a local scene, on a na nationwide scene, should have that level of ego either. If David Bowie can be chill and can somewhat have a little bit of humility and take that, you know, story, you know, not to be something that he can kind of negatively react to and take as a learning experience, then I don't think anyone else has any excuse, especially when you again consider the people like, you know, Virgil Abloh, who I mentioned, who was a supremely um, kind and gentle person and went out of his way just to be cool despite having one of the well despite having every reason to be a cunt he went out of his way not to be one so that's basically what i've been thinking about during the weekend when i've interacted with certain folk but anyway moving on to my weekend and what i got up to um because obviously you guys are going to be very very eager to find out and to learn what i did over the weekend because i know it's one of the bursting topics that has existed here on this podcast but um i went to a party on sunday which is very rare for me um but i went to an event um courtesy of e1 and labyrinth obviously you guys know i've been to a few labyrinth events over the last couple of years it felt like because they do a lot of stuff with djs that i you know i'm big fans of like dixon like arm like jimmy jules like tricks and stuff over the years and then of course i went to the um, the day festivals that they do also that have been pretty interesting in terms of uh 
a spectacle in terms of something to go to um the whole day festival thing is something that usually i don't think works that well here in the uk but they've done a really good job in terms of getting that to work especially at a scale that they do it at, especially with the people that who they're booking and whatnot etc etc anyway they had another event on on sundays i don't usually go out on sundays i miss quite a lot of sunday raves like the unfold at fold like a few happened that um at Star Lane Pizza, which is around the corner from Fall. There's a few other events that happen on Sunday that are pretty decent, but I tend to avoid them because I like to start my week, like on a Monday, with, you know, a clean sort of bill of health, go with the green juice, go work out and stuff, have a good fast. I don't like to kind of roll over the party season from the Monday, so the party kind of vibes from the Sunday into a Monday. So I try to avoid going out on a Sunday as much as possible, but obviously I go crazy on a Friday and a Saturday. But anyway, this weekend was a change because it was bank holiday weekend, so I thought, why not? Let's just let our head down and go a bit crazy. And this event also was kind of, you know, around the corner or near where I live, so not too far, especially on the bus or on an Uber or cycling. I've been like that many, many times, so it kind of gave me a excuse to go. And over the last couple of years, I've kind of fell in love with E1 in the same way that I kind of fell in love with Fabric. I was a real big critic of Fabric, a real big critic of E1, mostly because of their security. And I think in recent years, they've probably done a little bit of an upheaval and change the people who do security at E1 and at Fabric. And that's really made a big change to how I perceive the clubs. Fair enough, the booking people have probably changed too, or their booking strategy or vision of what they're doing. You know, for sure, you can tell for Fabric, they have a lot more eclectic events. They cover a whole a wide ranging, um, you know, genres and DJs and stuff. It's not just the same old kind of um, old white guys that they usually booked in the past. And the same can be said for E1. They have a real broad range, everything from like, you know, sex positive parties, like kink parties, all the way to like traditional house stuff all the way to like weirdo shit all the way to like scene stuff like from possession and whatnot they cover a real good breath of it so i do like to go to those type of places and also for me personally i think the sound system at e1 is always really good i love that massive speaker wall they got that's absolutely blaring out the tunes and sometimes can absolutely wreck your ears i love the two different rooms that they have they have very different vibes the main room is a bit more spacious and easy to kind of find a corner to chill in and the second room is usually a little bit more grungy a little bit more straight to your face a little bit more um just a little bit more intense in terms of the lights and how they put the smoke in there and how high up the dj is so i do like the overall feel of it so you know it was kind of a win-win when it comes to that event and of course the dj dj is playing in terms of arm who's also a part of innervisions in terms of henrik schwartz i've never who i haven't seen live in a very long time and jimmy jules of course who i'm a big fan of also so um sunday rolls around so sun, sunday rolls around from for the event for me to go to me and a friend obviously ended up going there and the first thing that i ended up doing that is something that i don't really do that often when i go out is that i decided not to have any alcohol well not to have any alcohol there i had a couple of drinks before i left i had like a little top couple of tonic wine things i usually get you know the magnum stuff the typical stuff that black boys drink before they go out but i decided this time around to try to do a raving experience with no alcohol and just stick into the class a substances and for the most part it went pretty well and to the point where now i'm thinking that this might be my general way of kind of doing my nights out because i felt way more refreshed in the morning i didn't have a crazy hangover my partying didn't spill into the tuesday it just kind of I just when i got home i was just basically tired because it essentially stayed until 7 a.m anyway um or right until the end maybe about half six i think maybe the lights officially came on but in general i felt way more fresh the next day than i would have done if i would have done the combination of the class a and the alcohol and it led me to believe that maybe alcohol as crazy as this sounds maybe alcohol is more destructive than class a on a day-to-day -day basis because i would imagine most people probably can't afford to buy many drugs on a daily basis especially if you're doing some of the better stuff and maybe alcohol because it's so cheap and readily available is easily um, abused etc etc but i had a really great time honestly um you know for the most part we just went and did like little runs to go get bottles of water and stuff which were quite expensive don't get me wrong for a nightclub right 250 for a bottle of water is crazy but still you got a nice chilled bottle of water that you could easily kind of pop open and close the lid if you need be and just a generally a cool and chill vibe i was able to party listen to everything remember my surroundings and just not be sloppy or be messy when i was kind of partying so i definitely would 
um, advocate or you know um, encourage people if you're like me and you do enjoy to go out a lot especially on the weekends try to have a couple of weekends where you maybe go out and don't drink as much or you don't drink at all and see how that goes because i really do think that it's a real big indicator to why you're out there in the first place and really will reveal your intentions and i feel like for me for the longest time when i was going out i had some troubles that i was kind of dealing with personally and i would maybe treat going out as an escape for my everyday life right i didn't really like the position i was in my life and my career goal whatever something was happening at the time right and i like to kind of go out and just completely get blacked out to the point where when I come back so to, to the point where I forget my everyday life but of course the next day it was still there so it was kind of a weird and bad way to kind of go about those sort of things but then over time once I started to get more involved in the scene I started DJing I started promoting I started doing the whole techno tourism stuff I started to realise no I actually enjoy nightlife I actually enjoy going to these different places seeing how these different scenes do things um, interacting with different people uh, and just kind of absorbing myself in that surrounding I've always been someone that I kind of wanted to always see and feel stuff for myself I never just went to read about an account of a of an event or of a club in a, in a magazine just be happy with that I went to go and touch and feel it myself and obviously I've been given the privilege and the luxury to go and do so you know through my job and through what I've been able to do over the years blah 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 so that was really good and I really did enjoy that so that's definitely something that I would encourage many many more people to go and do and then once you rock up to the event as per usual the organisation when it comes to getting in to E1 is always kind of A1 um, very easy to get into they've got the barricade set up around the club you queue up um the first security guard you you kind of get in touch with wants you to see their id and i'm guessing that's just to kind of root out anyone that's going to be waiting around for ages get to the front end and then they say you have you need to have id physical and then you haven't got it you have to go home again so not to waste your time they just quickly screen you make sure you got your id then you get to the queue and then somebody this time around which is pretty good was coming down the queue and just scanning everyone's qr code of their ticket so that when you then went through to the security stuff you could just quickly go and get your stamp and kind of go into the club so that was perfect and of course the cloakroom is really easy to use too one of the rare cloakrooms in club land especially in london that also accepts contact as pay or cards so you don't, if you don't have cash you can still be able to put your um bags and whatnot into the cloakroom and i would advise to do so unless you're willing and able to put your bag under a speaker or tie it around your waist because e1 gets really hot and sweaty the entire club is like really 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 sticky and there's a real lack of air conditioning in that entire place so i would recommend if you do go to e1 do put your bags and coats into the locker sorry into the cloakroom go into the main room and of course we spent most of our time um, listening to Henrik Schwartz and, and Arm playing a five hour set and from what I can see how they did the, the, the kind of layout was really different in the labyrinth because usually when I've been to E1 it's usually one big like the main room is kind of one big square on the right hand side is that big speaker wall and then towards the far end is where the DJ booth is right it's kind of a standard sort of layout but this time around labyrinth I guess in, in order maybe to boost the ticket sales or just to kind of offer a different experience to the punters they had a vip package and um they also had a table service sort of package tables no we'll say table service but table service so what they did is that on the edges um they kind of did these like barricades where they had these different sections where people could basically have their drinks kind of put on tables and whatnot in big little you know in those massive things you see in soho clubs it's massive containers for the people's drinks and ice and whatnot and then they had some staff who were kind of walking around there who were able to kind of serve people and whatnot whenever they kind of had their drinks so that was a pretty interesting setup which was a bit weird to kind of get our head around because it kind of made the club way smaller and sort of packed everybody into the middle like sardines but overall i think the vibe was pretty decent for the most part because it seemed like everybody that was in those kind of vip sections was also dancing and having a good time too there wasn't a lot of poses or people trying to look pretty everyone was really trying to turning up and i think a lot of it had to do with the fact that the general um what do you call it the general punters the ones that just bought regular tickets like i did were so hyped and ready to have a good dance like that crowd on sunday um as sketchy as it was because there was some weirdos in there to be honest but i did find it to be one of the best the better kind of club crowds that i've seen from labyrinth and i don't know if it's to do with the people that were playing whether it's to do with the the 
the date of the event being on a Sunday, whether it's through the location, but it was a generally pretty decent crowd. And I think that kind of added to the entire ambience of the event that we was in. So we bumped into a few friendly faces, a few cool people, had some cool random conversations. And generally, it was a really, really good night. And I think in terms of playing, in terms of playing, it was so nice and cool to see Henrik Schwartz play. I haven't seen him play in such a long time. I remember there was a period, I think, early in my sort of like going out sort of like timeline where I seem to kind of see Henrik Schwartz out a lot more often I'm not too sure if he kind of took a break if he maybe didn't tour as much here in the UK but I haven't really seen him on bills or on lineups a lot so to get Henrik Schwartz to play out here in London again was pretty cool to see and then of course Arm played an extended five hour set which you don't regularly see we don't really usually see him play that often when he does come here and I think that really suited his style and I think there was some conversation to be had around whether or not some people believe that Arm might be a better DJ and Dixon which is crazy to think because the whole reason why this is crazy to think because there was a point in time where Dixon was voted I'm sure I'm, I don't remember exactly but I think it might be four times he was voted resident advisors top DJ four times in a row back to back right and I think that was maybe the main reason why he kind of propelled his stardom he went from being a regular a, a relatively well-known kind of house DJ on the local scene in terms of Berlin and then as soon as he kind of got kept vo getting voted you know top DJ on RA suddenly his stock went super super high and obviously you know Dixon's known for his flawless mixing his great sequencing and just really being a really astute DJ and kind of you know in terms of how he kind of delivers sets and whatnot and the build up and everything tension all that stuff is really good when he puts these sets but if it has felt like even for me being a big Dixon fanboy somebody that's listened to all these interviews and really reads all these interviews and watches all these interviews and checks out all these releases and it's in the comments check you know talking about what shirt he's wearing and on forums and whatnot it is quite interesting to see that over the years maybe the fact that he's been such a high profile dj now for such a long time and he's clearly trying to take his profile to the next level which obviously allows him to do more interesting things with his label inner visions and whatnot it does feel like maybe the djing has taken a bit of a back what's ever it's, it's taking a bit of a back seat in terms of maybe he's taking his foot off the pedal in terms of delivering really high octane level kind of sets I think the last time I saw Dixon play a really stellar 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 set was when he played um there was an Innovision label showcase that they did a few years ago in Fold that legitimately might have been one of the best parties I've ever been to over there, right? That was the first time I kind of got exposed to Jimmy Jules playing live and Dixon played, you know, an incredible set. You could tell he was really feeling it. He kind of felt the vibe with Fold being such a smallish type venue with all the people that fully, it was probably one of the fullest I've ever seen it too for that kind of level of event. But then since then, it kind of felt like to me that maybe he's, I wouldn't say phoning in the sets, but it's not as high of a level as it was in the past but then on the other end of things when it comes to arm i feel like he has also kind of left lifted the level up to a weird level too where he's really good where sometimes you see some clips of him playing courtesy of instagram accounts like arm to dixon you think to yourself rah is arm actually better than dixon these days he's really bringing it and i think this set um in e1 maybe solidified it to the point where maybe i think like if arm isn't better than dixon he's definitely on the same level they're not as kind of you know um the levels aren't as far off as they were maybe in the past which is obviously a good thing i think overall as a label right you'd still want i think if you're dixon you probably still want people like tricks and jimmy jules to surpass you in some way because it makes the label stronger if they have all these killers and they don't just want one person bringing all the food in right because there was a point in time where dixon was the only one really getting all the bookings but now over time with all the releases and the fact that they've got all this increased profile on instagram accounts like i mentioned before bloody blah, blah 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 people are now booking them individually they're not just booking them to be like oh we want you to play back to back or whatnot they're booking them like oh we want tricks we want jimmy we want this we want that so that obviously helps the label but overall i loved what they did with the space i loved um again like i said the vip booth didn't really disturb the overall flow of the event i don't feel like i feel like the vip package that they did offer to people was pretty substantial and did really f give you another kind of experience of the night i managed to get a vip wristband off of some random person so i was able to slip in and kind of see what the experience was like and the vip wristband allowed you to basically go around the back of the dj where the booth was which was a pretty sick you know place to be to kind of check out the dj up, up and close in that kind of way and obviously you got the ability to go to the vip little sections where they had the tables and stuff which was really cool too because they had loads of ice in there and for some reason people just left their tables and left their drinks unattended so i was able to grab some ice and kind of keep myself hydrated and whatnot so that was pretty nice and because i wasn't on the alcohol you know i kind of left that to one 
side, but that was pretty cool to see. So the VIP package, although it was a little bit overpriced in terms of being 50 to 60 pound, I think 50, I would have definitely um, have jumped on it if I was there, but 60, 70 is probably not, you know, it's probably a little bit more uh, expensive than I would like to spend. But if you're going to go out and not drink, maybe you could maybe afford to do such a thing. But overall, I thought the event was really well put together and everything, and I really did have a great time. And um, here's a quick video compilation I put together featuring Henrik Schwartz and Arm playing. I'm going to play a bit of it and skip around. Hopefully you can hear the vibe and feel the atmosphere. And of course, oh, last thing to add to, I liked whatever they had these things. If you can see the video, there's these weird kind of projection screen things going on around the back and the top of the of the venue. I'm not sure if there were LCD screens or if there were projections from a projector, but whatever they were, they really did add to the event. So again, it feels like every event that they're basically improving the production quality, tweaking little things here and there, labyrinth and kind of, in, you know, just trying to provide a somewhat bespoke events, a bespoke events in venues that everyone's kind of com familiar with, because I'm sure people have been there, have all been to E1 in one, you know, in, on one occasion or not. So it's nice to have them have that kind of ability to do such a thing. And also last thing, they had this room at the front of the venue. I'm not sure if that was a chill out room, but there was a DJ playing in this. That was pretty cool to see too. So it was a room that if you went just to kind of somewhat unwind, you could also go and occupy. So they kind of did a really good job in putting it all together. But like I said before, I'm a big fan of E1 and E1 as a club, so it was always going to win that way. But let me play the clip so you can hear and feel what the vibe was about. This is Henrik Schwartz. Oh, and also what a big difference it makes when the crowd is dancing and having a good time. That's what it felt like. It was so refreshing to see that. And again, there wasn't any um, stipulation about people, you know, putting stickers on phones and no pictures and stuff. For some reason, people were just ready to have a good time maybe it was because of the bank holiday vibes who knows but really 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 decent crowd man and i think unfortunately for club nights in london it feels like the crowd really dictates whether or not you have a good time or not so you know it doesn't matter what the what the promoter does what the venue does what the dj does sometimes if there's a shitty crowd it just will ruin your night so that can be a little bit disappointing because it's completely out of control and completely out of control of the people that are putting on the event but this time around it really did work the crowd did a really good job to add, add to everything so big up everybody that came with the good vibes This is arm playing. More Henrik Schwartz to be fast forward a bit more arm so you can hear a bit of that. Whatever this tune was, this might have been my favorite tune the whole night. It was towards the end. <sighs> the bass on this was incredible to feel and witness in IRL, honestly. And this is towards the end when they're wrapping things up. They turn on the lights for the last, like, um, what, 20 minutes or so, which is a bit weird and kind of put you out of the, you know, put you out of the flipping zone because you're basically aware the lights are on and stuff and tripping your balls out and your IP balls dilated and whatnot. And everyone had the girly face, uh, high face in the morning, but it was quite nice. It was a quite a nice little refresh. I mean, to, before you headed out, so you wasn't completely blinded by the daylight as you walked out. <laughs> Thank you. 
but yeah that was it for the most part and then the only other thing is a slight con- slight kind of you know L on our part we did or I did try to get a picture with Arm at the end like a big fat groupie that I am and of course that wasn't possible because I guess he had to rush off or he wasn't really in the mood to take pictures or whatnot I don't know what the deal was but that was a little bit cringe a little bit embarrassing but hey I think you know being a fan I think for the most part is a good thing and also being an unapologetic fan that's also you know interested in meeting these people in real life is actually nice i feel like despite sometimes how the reaction how they might react or how they might come off in terms of being rude or maybe not exactly giving you a response you want i think it's also always nice to kind of let people know who you're a fan of that you're a fan of them do you know what i mean it's always nice to them for them to see that you're a real real fan and you actually kind of pay attention and follow them for real and you're not just here for the hype and bloody blah 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 but you know unfortunately we weren't able to get a picture with arm but hopefully next time we see him maybe we will get a picture maybe we will moving on news courtesy of bbc news regarding the leeds festival i always hate to see these sort of things because it makes me feel somewhat guilty it makes me have somewhat you know a level of survivor's guilt even though it's not about me at all but this tragic news courtesy of bbc really kind of hit me today it says leeds festival boy 16 dies after falling ill is suspected drug incident and now and then again the story develops and now we've got an idea on who the kid is it says family of a beautiful fiercely independent boy pays tribute after he died following the Leeds festival so that's the young boy there and the, for the article goes as follows on sky news it says the family of a 16 year old who died after falling ill at Leeds festival has paid tribute to the beautiful fiercely independent boy david salino from worsley manchester was taken to the festival's medical tent on saturday night and died in hospital on sunday morning our david was a beautiful fiercely independent and warm character who lived every day at 110 percent and would love to spend time enjoying music with his friends his family said he had just received his fabulous GCC results got into college and had hoped to study computer science at top university bloody hell Leeds festival was a highlight of his summer ultimately it was taken it ultimately has to take his life in the most unfair cruel and horrible way and we are broken West Yorkshire Police conducting inquiries into the death officers supporting David's family. On Sunday, the force said it had launched an investigation into a suspected drug-related death. Officers were called at 10.16 p.m. on Saturday after the teenager was taken to the event's medical tent. He was taken to hospital and died on Sunday morning. Assistant Chief Constable Catherine Hawk- Hackinson of West Yorkshire Police said, Our force are with the family of the boy who has died and we have officers supporting them in every very difficult time. While the exact cause of death is yet to be established, one line of inquiries taken, particular type of ecstasy, MD a tablet which was described as grey or black oblong shape at this moment in time this is believed to be an isolated incident as we have not received any similar reports users of any drug or not professionally prescribed can never be sure of its content and risk involved anyone who's feeling ill take advantage take a station seek urgent medical attention the reason why this hits home is because obviously as I mentioned previously I went to an event on Sunday you know E1 and Labyrinth uh, featuring Arm and Henrik Schwartz and uh, Jimmy Jules and I went there under the proviso of trying out a new thing, which I don't usually do, which was basically stay off, stay off the alcohol and just stick to taking a couple of pills um, in order to kind of, you know, add to my night's nice enjoyment, which is definitely something that I don't usually do. I usually do get on the alcohol pretty heavy and then combine it with the drugs that can sometimes get you a bit loopy. But usually that's kind of what people do when they go out to these sort of events. But over the time, especially nowadays, where I've kind of been dialing back my going out and my ability to recover has been dwindling i've had to kind of find a balance and i thought the only balance really to make is to sort of abstain from one or the other maybe totally because abstain from any drugs and alcohol or abst- or choose one and then just stick with it so i decided to just stick with the pills and decided hey i know i can probably only manage to do one or maybe one and a half the whole night anyway so why not just leave off the alcohol and just kind of enjoy the pills as I kind of go along and kind of hydrate myself throughout the day. And of course, the next day, I kind of felt really fresh. I didn't have a burnt, crashing hangover, um, which you know instantly made me realize how damaging the effects of alcohol can be, especially in combination with drugs. But sometimes the, the fad, sad thing about this sort of stuff is because when you read the article, of course, it says there were no other inc- instances you know that were kind of reported incidences were reported, right, when this kid fell ill. So clearly it was something that he just was unlucky with or maybe he got a bad batch like he was the only one that got it um but it is really unfortunate when these things happen and i feel like in general maybe these deaths as well could be prevented in some way if there was a more open um line of communication when it comes to drug use i feel like for the most part especially in the uk there is this sort of taboo around drugs um there is this sort of like um 
hear no see no evil hear no evil when it comes about it people try to basically bury their head in the sand but we know through statistics and stuff you know england london has really high usage of drugs especially when it comes to stuff like cocaine and whatnot right you find crazy um, amounts i think at one point i remember reading an article that london or the uk had the highest amounts of cocaine users or usage in the entirety of europe which is absolutely insane do you remember that report too one time where they found really high traces of cocaine residue in the houses of parliament and shit so clearly it's kind of infiltrated every part of society it's not just affecting people in the working class you know middle class or upper class it's affecting everybody everybody is somewhat um affected by drugs the effects of it or fans of it or consumers of it whatever it may be but the con conversation around safe drug use the conversation around um safety is not really open it feels like everything's kind of done in shadows or whatnot even when you have to get your stuff tested you kind of have to send it anonymously it's all cloak and dagger stuff and i think that doesn't really help when it comes to kids and them wanting to take drugs because there is no honest conversations around it right there is no kind of oh where could your concerns be met um with some level of consideration and not be judged and whatnot so kids are going into these kind of things wanting to a impress their friends wanting to also be naughty and do something and just wanting to take a chance and it can sometimes you know end really badly but it's also just un maybe it just might be just pure unluck unlucky Imagine, imagine be purely, purely unlucky his entire group of friends could have also taken the same batch of pills and they could be completely fine and it affects somebody completely differently but i also want to say that maybe also there should be a conversation around encouraging kids to also go especially when they're in at this sort of age that's uh, those kind of developmental age especially when i was going out most of my time used to be spent around just drinking loads of alcohol i wasn't even taking drugs that much at that time at all i don't think i started really really late but there should be a conversation around just being able to enjoy your nights out sober. I know there's a lot of Gen Z kids who are really into sort of alternative um, way lifestyles when it comes to, you know, maybe, or, you know, diets or eating, you know, when it comes to avoiding gluten, being vegan, being vegetarian and whatnot. But I would like that conversation to be extended into stuff like drugs and alcohol also, where they get to the point where maybe this newer generation aren't that infatuated or kind of gripped by the hooks of alcohol and drugs as maybe my generation was, millennials and whatnot. I think that might be a good way to go about things because unfortunately us brits don't have a middle gear there is no such thing as a you know second gear we try to we basically go all the way to the end and um, we don't really take any half measures or half steps so maybe that's really affecting us also but i would like to see that kind of happen a kind of a maturity when it comes to nightlife um where it doesn't have to always revolve around drugs and alcohol because i see that a lot when i go to berlin like for everybody that gets you know that crashes out on ghb there's also an entirely big scene of people who just go out for the vibes who go out drink a club mate and just chill they don't do anything do you know what i mean they just go out and just basically pay for a cloakroom and just buy club mates with 10 euros as many took up as they can with 10 euros and that's exactly it they do so but they also don't have a middle ground right they have people who get on it every single day and are completely messed up and get lost in the source but they also have people who are completely stone cold sober but still go out to heavy industrial techno night so it's really bizarre but we don't seem to have that other side of things so maybe deaths like this can maybe you know inspire kids and maybe explore different ways of kind of enjoying their nights out but if regardless of whatever it may be it's absolutely tragic my thoughts and feelings go out to the family of this kid david salino um it really is horrible horrible news to hear especially considering he was going after such a big monumental occasion in his life in gcse he's getting good results applying to go to college and this sort of you know festival is probably a great way to kind of celebrate and cap off a pretty tough year do you know what i mean in terms of revising and selecting a college you go just all kind of really stressful especially at that age kind of trying to figure out what you want to do with your kind of rest of your life quote unquote so you would imagine you know going to Leeds festival and seeing your favorite bands and artists play would be a good way to sort of like cap off the year and sort of gonna kind of get you ready before you head into going to college and starting the next chapter of your life and then for it to end in such a in such a catastrophic way is really really sad um so yeah thoughts and feelings go out to his family and friends and everyone connected with the guy it really is bleak to read this man but i think you know, these conversations need to be had and open and hopefully um there's some good can come off the back of this tragic news in it so again r.i.p david salino r.i.p david salino moving on from that we're going to head into some sneaker news now i wanted to talk about these cactus plant flea market nike dunk lows quote-unquote overgrowns the news around them is as follows allegedly 
they were meant to come out a while back ago and they were meant to come out sans this sort of kind of crazy fur overgrown monster kind of um things they got on top of the upper right that's how they were meant to come out but then for the most for some reason they got delayed and it was said that the designer for cactus plant flump for cactus plant flea market went back to the drawing board they wanted to make some additions and changes to it to kind of really make it make them her own and then that's when these were added on top of it which is really interesting because you don't really see that often when it comes to nike collaborations um you know usually when you see an image that gets leaked of a collab they usually come out quite soon after whether, whether it's because nike get nervous and think because people have seen it too early they might get put off it regardless or i don't know what happens but you rarely see a leak of a shoe from a big collaborator that then goes back to the drawing board and gets edited again usually just, just stick with what you see or maybe a slight tweak but this is a complete design change that completely changes the entire sort of like silhouette look and feel of the shoes and weirdly enough i know i shouldn't like them and i know i should be kind of dissing them but i really really like them i like whatever style i like whatever this is whether it's a grinch thing whether it's inspired by something else but i think they look so loopy in the same way that jeremy scott and this looked really crazy and kind of far out there and really different from what you'd see out on the market that these are quite refreshing because essentially it's still a dunk that um the cactus plant flea market person has basically reinterpreted or re you know reimagined but it's been done in a more interesting way which is why it made, which is what made the first edition of it so interesting even though i said i didn't like it it still made it interesting because at least they tried to kind of you know make it their own the, the midsole is kind of a bit messed up the uppers are a bit tweaked so it doesn't actually look like a dunk but it is based on a dunk kind of base and model but i feel like this fur kind of weird grinch print thing they got going on on top of it which is a combination of like dark greens lime greens forest greens pine greens and all other greens and you've got this really crazy speckled um laces going on there as well it looks absolutely incredible for me i really 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 like them and i can't wait till they come out now i'm hoping that this dunk low collaboration with cactus plant flea market isn't a tier zero sort of thing because usually that happens right usually um i remember that what was that last collaboration they did on the nike dunk that was kind of like covered in um diamantes and shit right that was like a friends and family type pair and then the one that came into general public was a little bit more toned down i'm hoping this is not the friends and family tier zero pair and then the one we get is going to be the one without the fur on it i hope this is what we everybody is able to buy in the stores because i feel like they're really interesting really different and really kind of um tell a different story with this whole dunk resurgence thing that's been going on for the cu past couple of years it feels like because i'm already tired of the dunk shape i've had enough of it i don't really care for the menu i've never really cared for dunks that much anyway in the first place i've always been more of an air force one guy but over time especially over recent time the the resurgence of the dunk and the, the re-celebration of it from nike has been super ott they've been pushing it down our throats non-stop but i do feel like if you're gonna do a dunk and you're gonna do it well this is probably the way to do it and i'm really really excited to see these come out and hopefully they do come out very very soon i think there's another picture here that i wanted to check wanted to show you just yeah so additional pictures here courtesy of over under which look absolutely sick especially once they're kind of taken you know courtesy sorry of an account called private selection i think they're a podcast in the show or, or a store or something but they put together these really clear pictures that kind of show exactly what they look like and essentially because at first when i saw them i thought the fur on the top um or the, the material whatever it may be was um was removable i thought it was like a skin similar to kind of what um travis scott did on his air trainer ones he had that kind of sort of like tent thing that you kind of you know uh button up and whatnot i thought that was the same thing with these but clearly it's not clearly the upper is going to look the way it's going to look like that i've seen here in the picture because you've got the laces that kind of go over it which is going to be interesting to see how people lace them up because how are you going to be able to find the holes with all this fur covering it but i would imagine that if you wanted to wear them without laces you could because dunk lows if i'm not mistaken sb is having an elasticated tongue they have a puffy tongue and elasticated tongue which obviously helps to keep your foot in one place um so i'd imagine that'll be pretty easy to kind of not wear laces with them if you don't want to but i think they look really cool i think they look really interesting like again like i said they look like nothing else on the market at the moment even from a designer collaborate even from like a designer a brand you're not seeing them make something as crazy as this which they probably should make i said it many times i think here on the show that i do get disappointed when like high-end fashion brands just 
copy like a New Balance silhouette or like an Air Max silhouette or whatnot or an Air Force silhouette because I feel like it's lazy, especially given the resources they have. They should be trying to do more interesting things um, with with footwear and trying to present more interesting ideas and put together different propositions. But they just tend to go for the same old, same old tire silhouette. So to see um, Cactus Plant Flea Market do this and basically, you know, take a dunk, which is again a tired, tired model that definitely needs to be put on the back shelf and just kind of given a rest and told to RIP the fact that they've been able to take such a tired and overdone model and really revamp it to the point where even I am a fan of it says a lot about them and what they're doing but these look absolutely sick I'm really I'm a big fan of them the insole have this like left right thing on the insole too it looks sick but essentially they're in covered in green once I like, I like that as well that one shoe on the other side is kind of like inverted when it comes to the colors so you get different sort of color makeup on there which I think makes them look far more interesting too on foot and I really can't wait to see these out about in person people wearing them but I definitely like them. I think they look absolutely fantastic I'm sure there'll be a Marmite shoe that most people won't be a fans of but I absolutely love them and everything about them and I'm hoping hoping fingers crossed that these don't these aren't like a tier zero thing oh look actually the midsole also is different right on the right and the left shoe one shoe is kind of like this gray somewhat like upcycled midsole thing like you know what nike did before when they'd kind of get what was that thing that nike did where they would um recycle soles and whatnot or old shoes sorry and make them and make the rubber of the outsoles of new shoes into them i think they should put that option on nike id too so one side of the shoe i think it's the right has that kind of gray um speckled recycled type look and the other is a dark brown sort of like a muddy sort of look so that's pretty cool to see from the out in when you're wearing them so that's a really really nice addition so you got, you got the brown outsole and then you got the gray outsole on them also but yeah these look absolutely hard i'm a big fan of them i know some people on here won't be a big fan of them i'm gonna be like i guess you know what you're saying you're absolutely going crazy but i like everything about them oh look the entire upper is different too so even at the back of the hill tab um the one with the gray outsole and midsole um is also got a gray hill cap and same goes for the brown so definitely completely different and you've got this nice speckled um laces there maybe i would have preferred to have rape, rope laces instead of these flat laces they might have worked better in terms of this upper and the fur type color and look they're going for but i like everything about them and then on the tongue you've got the nike in uh, you know logo um stitched on there on the top which is quite clear and then you've got the cactus plant flea market cpfm logo brand motif kind of there as well on the outside but yeah they look absolutely hard again always interesting the thing i like about cactus plant flea market even though i don't like everything they do at least they have a point of view they have some sort of vision they have a proposition that's different from everyone else out there they're not just putting out nonsense or just kind of regurgitating the same old same old so it's nice to see them actually doing some interesting things out there so when they do end up coming out when's the date do we have a date here because the hype is article there's no date so far when they're meant to be coming out um nike dunk low overgrown by cactus plant flea market no it's no date yet holiday season sometime soon but hopefully we get a, a date for them soon because i'm definitely going to try and copy them because they look absolutely sick i'm a big fan i'm a big fan moving on moving on let's get rid of this uh we've got this news this is quite good news i have to be honest right because i'm i have to be completely honest i've been a bit frustrated and annoyed about this kind of back and forth and the fact that it wasn't coming to an end and people having debates and arguments online and the designer himself seemingly appearing to be somewhat unaware of how he's coming across or how idiotic the whole entire thing is it just was a shit show from everybody that was involved in it right but this news is courtesy of nice kicks which i think is really really good and it says as follows it says nike and john geiger reach settlement in trademark infringement lawsuit as you guys would know um john geiger makes these essentially you know he's kind of flip or rip of a nike Air force one silhouette and he does them in these really cool interesting colors and materials and whatnot and he's been kind of doing this for a very very long time i think the reason why i'm familiar with john geiger if i'm not mistaken were from those air force ones that everyone was wearing for a while ago i forgot the name of them but he essentially took an air force one high and stitched loads of different swooshes on them do you remember there was like different swooshes i think they're like four or something on the side and i thought those looked pretty sick so i'm kind of familiar with what he does in general but you know he's been kind of famous as well for doing these um shoes the gf ones that he's been kind of pushing out there but essentially you know it's just an air force one kind of update 
updated with his kind of logo on the side um maybe different proportion different materials but essentially it's the same sort of silhouette and then nike decided enough was enough they didn't like him copying um what they were doing and profiting off of it so they decided to sue and then john geiger responded with a counterclaim i think where he was essentially arguing for the right to copy um which was absolutely bizarre and i think on social media he was kind of you know flipping out and going crazy which makes a lot of sense now considering he was going up against nike multi-billion dollar company he essentially his whole entire livelihood and the future of his family was basically on the line because if they if they would have you know took it to the nth degree and got awarded a crazy settlement that could have cut that could basically bankrupt him to a point where he could never make anything again so maybe his flip outs online made a lot of sense but me personally um, even though I'm not a fan of Nike, even though I'm not a fan of customizers, sneaker customizers in general, I feel like the creativity in the sneaker customizing scene is at an all time low. Most of these guys have no creativity, no imagination whatsoever. They just repeat and regurgitate the same things again and again and again. Essentially, they're, they are as culpable as Nike are for putting out retros continually. They don't really make any new interest in silhouettes. They just take the same old shoes everyone's wearing nowadays, like Jordans, and update them with a, you know, the same old tired um, sneaker flipping customizer updates like Pi iPhone leather and snake skin and all this sort of garbage stuff that no one wants and then kind of overprice them to the point where it doesn't really make any sense where you're paying like a thousand pound for something that's being quote unquote handmade it's absolute bullshit I would much prefer those guys to use their talents and their skills of craftsmanship to actually develop and you know make their own actual shoes from the ground up why not especially nowadays in this market I feel like the appetite for people to wear something that's in that's kind of new and unique and you can't really get in a lot of places is there and people are willing to spend the money um, why not make something new and interesting in terms of a shape why just take the same old thing that Nike are putting out there and just kind of do your spin on it and then charge more for it, it just doesn't make any sense for me personally so I never really liked it so but then in a weird way I also like what he does the other things right he does like these weird bathrobes he has these slippers he puts out I actually like that stuff because I think it kind of matches his brand a little bit more that kind of luxurious sort of um, rich sneakerhead sort of vibe thing I think he would do really well and he's kept on designing those sort of things or maybe just creating his own silhouette so i didn't really understand why somebody who's clearly got a creative bone in his body clearly somebody has passionate about shoes would be fighting for the right to copy when he could be spending all that time creativity and resources focusing on actually making something new and fresh but hey I'm not him, so maybe there's more to the story. But anyway, this story and this conclusion is definitely something that brings a smile to my face because hopefully this means John Geiger will go and focus on making some cool and interesting things instead of trying to leech off the back of what Nike have done and fighting for the right to copy because I think that's absolutely redacted. But anyway, the article says as follows. It's not every day that Nike goes from engaging in a year-long battle to acknowledging that they respect the very person they filed a suit against while giving their well wishes for the continuation of that person's business. It's been over a year since Nike admitted this lawsuit against La La Land Production and Designing to include notable designer John Geiger, accusing him of trademark infringement and brand confusion with the rising popularity of his sneaker model, the GF01. On August the 30th, Nike issued the following statement announcing the parties had officially reached a final sentiment and the case was closed so all of that abuse that they were putting him under the spotlight pressuring him lawyer fees court fees whatever it may be the nike decided you know what we're not bothered anymore let's call it let's call it quits shake hands and go our separate ways pretty sick but the same as it reads as follows nike and john geiger have resolved the lawsuit related to the nike air force one trade dress and john geiger's footwear product specifically his gf1 shoes the lawsuit has been resolved for an amicable resolution that includes a consent judgment as part of this resolution john geiger has agreed to modify the design of his gf1 so he's still able to make them which is an incredible result nike respects john geiger as a designer and other designers like him and both parties are pleased to resolve the dispute in a way that allows John Geiger to continue building his brand while also respecting Nike's intellectual property rights of his iconic Air Force One trade dress. Now on Nike's end, it did look a bit nuts, right? To come after such a small, relatively small person in comparison to them, somebody that is intrinsically a part of the sneaker culture, a sneaker scene out there in the US and, um, and essentially go to war with sneaker customizers all over the world right because this basically will set a precedent that they don't want you to do all these things again because essentially they could come after everybody that's doing those shoes that they designed on flipping alibaba and tabo and shit right the ones that way they replace the swoosh with a fucking machine gun or whatever they do so this was essentially gonna be a watershed moment so the fact that nike have conceded goes to show that maybe somebody at nike hq was like you know what as much of a reason we have to sue this guy and we have every reason to do so it it also isn't a bad it also is a very bad look in terms of optics it makes us look crazy 
Nike already look crazy, especially when it comes to retros. They already look crazy, especially when it comes to this updated shoe that's coming out at the moment. This fucking reimagined Jordan 1 they've got coming out that's going to contain a fake receipt from a mom and pop store, which is really insulting, considering what Nike did to the mom and pop industry in general, right? They essentially decimated it by basically making them or forcing them to buy 500 fucking product styles if they wanted to get one shoe that they really wanted, right? So essentially they killed independent retail stores from stocking Nike products. To the point where I don't think even Nike, even Full Look, I don't know which one, Big Brand doesn't stock me, but regardless, Nike killed the mom and pop stores, but now here they come with a Jordan 1 um, reimagined, which they're going to artificially age and then also include a receipt that makes it look like you bought them from the 1980s, like a little yellow sort of receipt with, from transfer paper sort of thing. So obviously optic wise and how they perceive themselves is at an all time low um the quality standards of nike is on all time low how they release really shows how they release really shows shoes and how you know the ability to sneak has to get pairs is really really bad um the sneakers app is an absolute failure everything around nike and you know the backdooring of stuff you got marcus jordan backdooring shoes again Marcus Jordan thing has he got his fucking account taken away from him no of course not so all these kind of different rules for different people crazy stuff going on you got that you know story of that kid essentially using his mum's staff discount and card to buy stock buy Nike stock because she was working there and she got fired like loads of really messed up stuff right perception wise so clearly Nike maybe our understanding of that and wanted to have a little bit of a small win and get back on the good graces of some sneakerheads and maybe this is a great way to go about things but also I feel like it should serve as a wake-up call for people like John Geiger and Sneaker Customizer of the World Ride because I always felt like sneakerheads in general are really cringe, right? From There's a guy recently I saw who's basically showing off his um, Virgil Abloh, Louis Vuitton, Nike Air Force Ones, and he had his car wrapped in the same sort of colorway. Absolute cringe. There's nothing worse than sneakerheads that kind of turn furniture into trainers or have boxes of shoes all over the living room and put them into perspex boxes. Like, absolutely rid ridiculous. I hate everything about it. But... There's also an issue when it comes to sneaker customizers because they're not very creative or inventive or interesting in their designs. They just do the same old stuff. They basically retro the same shoes, add Python leather to it in crazy colors or whatnot that no one really wants to buy and they want to charge you five times the value of the shoe or whatnot. Absolutely insane. When I think all their skill and their talent of actually crafting things with their bare hands, being able to scalpel sushis and you know um, tear off paint and put angeles paint on the upper and all this really cool stuff they did do and change the midsole or do midsole swap from old vintage shoes all this really cool stuff that people can do you should be you should really be applying that to maybe manufacturing your own shoes especially nowadays considering the access people have to like factories in china factories here in europe i'm sure there are factories out there in the u.s that could be making small runs of shoes and whatnot that's what you should be doing especially given the appetite of people to be sneakerheads right now and to be not and to be kind of seen as the first person to do so and stuff that's what they should be doing but they aren't because they're lazy and because they want to cash in and need to check so maybe this will hopefully wake them up to kind of do the right thing and actually go back to being creative and interesting instead of regurgitating the same old same old but it is good to see regardless i'm happy for john geiger because you know even i'm not a fan of all his work i didn't want to see this guy get completely ruined by this lawsuit and maybe again this would hopefully be a wake-up call for all involved to do more interesting things please por favor Next, moving on, we've got this interesting post courtesy of Kanye West that I wanted to quickly highlight because I feel like at some point, for me personally, there has to come a time where Kanye maybe looks at his, you know, situation with corporations and whatnot and maybe comes to the conclusion that it may be him that may be the issue or it may be that because he's willing and uh because yeah because he's willing and interested to work with corporations to get his ideas out to a you know a large amount of people that he has to accept that corporations are always going to do what corporations do and that is fuck you over and this latest post from Kanye West on Instagram which says as follows it's got a picture which highlights the Yeezy Gap uh, Balenciaga sunglasses that he's been kind of showcasing online which they've had a really cool marketing campaign where they've you know he's given pairs to notable people in the scene and basically told them to take selfies and they look really cool in them and shit and they kind of add this really weird effect that makes them look kind of black and white and really strange and kind of you know dystopian vibe it's really really cool with regards to the activation around the whole thing and hopefully they come out really soon but he's had a picture of them on the desk and i think this might be a different um 
version of them because they look a bit more iridescent there's a lot more of a different sort of color on the frame they're not just silver they kind of got like a little rainbow purpley sort of like feel to them and in the caption he's read is written as follows gap held a meeting about me without me and we've heard this before from Kanye because he was moaning I think about um a recent Adidas slide that looks eerily similar to a Yeezy slide and then I think he also moaned about the release and how things are being made and put together and also yeah that's funny he, he moaned about the Yeezy day where essentially um, Adidas put together a special day kind of like Air Max day where they re-released loads of old Yeezy models that maybe didn't sell as well or maybe they reproduced I'm not really sure what the deal was but essentially it was an opportunity for Yeezy fans to get a hold of colorways and shoes that maybe they missed out on throughout the year right and it was really successful I feel like Everything, everything sold out I couldn't log onto the site it was basically down for ages but by the time I got on it everything had already gone but when Kanye came out and said oh he didn't know nothing about it and he didn't approve it it was quite surprising because I just assumed he would be integral to kind of putting something like that together but knowing Kanye as well it didn't really make sense that he would do such an event like Easy Day it's a bit more it's a bit basic bitch for him do you know what I mean he'd probably prefer to just put everything out or just keep producing and manufacturing it <coughs> and when it sells out it sells out so clearly there's some disconnect going on between what he's between him and the Adidas board or Yeezy board, whatever it may be. But for me personally, having dealt with corporations and also having taken the decision to kind of do my own thing, however small and measly it may be, I also accepted the time when I was unable to kind of navigate the corporate scene that it wasn't always them. It was also me, right? I didn't have the ability to kind of, you know, swallow my pride, um, be kind of... Um, somewhat a team player or whatever it may be right there was something about my personality that didn't really gel well with that kind of senior industry but everybody else that I kind of was around who was able to navigate that kind of you know rocky waters is basically doing really well for themselves and a lot of it has to come down to kind of your personality um, and just basically how you act around these people but in general what I found is that most corporations without fail are always going to fuck you over especially if you're a creative right there's always going to come a point where you kind of butt heads especially if you're creative to the purest extent as Kanye is, which I have no doubt he is, right? So he has very kind of um, utopian sort of ideals and views around how he wants his work to be presented, to be showcased, to be displayed, um, to be interpreted, to be touched, to be felt, whatever it may be. But when you're running a business, sometimes you just want to, you know, you're you're about the X's and O's, do you know what I mean? You're not really thinking about all that heady stuff. So there's clearly going to be a disconnect there. And I feel like, with Kanye throughout his entire time of pushing for this sort of position and platform that he has at the moment, he's always stressed to us the importance of corporations, right? Be be back in the day, we were all saying, why don't you do it on your own, right? We were all saying the same thing that Sway was saying, and he was telling us we didn't have the education, we didn't really know what the deal was, we didn't know all these Vivindis, all this sort of stuff, and over time he's been proved right, right? He's basically showed us that he's he was never really bad at design, especially when he did his first question, you know, that he funded himself. He just never had the right resources at hand to allow him to present his ideas on a bigger scale and clearly the, at the moment at the point he got you the right resources and the right backing behind him it was no surprise that all his stuff took off but i also feel like there's a lack of acceptance on his end that part of the um part of the what would they call it what's that thing called it's like a devil's agreement part of that kind of agreement that you take right that that handshake that you make with these corporations is that you have to also expect anticipate um that they will fuck you over somewhere down the line no matter how good it starts because i remember at the beginning you know he was sort of like you know farming his nose at nike about how well Adidas was treating him they gave him everything he won he was at like the main guy obviously he's making loads of money and again if you have to think about it as well usually they say you only get the sort of like breathing room to do what you want when you kind of bring in loads of money in, right? You're the person that's sort of keeping the lights on kind of thing. But this also goes to prove it doesn't matter how much money you generate for a company, there's going to be people who are going to want to stick their nose in, um, have their say, make their own decisions because they need to kind of, you know, look like they're doing something and also make them look good in terms of them wanting to get a promotion one. There's all these kind of weird corporate musical chair kind of game things going on there. So I feel like he should know that at this point. He's dealt with enough corporation that he should be aware of it. But for some reason, he just seems incapable of understanding that side of business. Now, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe because it means, because he's pushing for complete inclusion, 
complete control, complete oversight, complete um, final say, all these kind of things. Maybe what will happen in the end is that like everything that Kanye does, because he's the first one, he's going to have to go through all these growing pains. He's going to have to take all the bullets. But then further down the line, when the next generation come up and they have their own deals under Adidas, under Gap, under Balenciaga, whatever they may do, they will have a far better time navigating those waters and they'll be given far more autonomy than what they do because they've kind of learned from the lessons of previous years. Because I always felt like for me, if you're a big corporation and you have the ability to collaborate with somebody as high profile as Kanye, who's not only really correct, not only really creative and does really great work, but he's also incredibly commercially successful too. He sells products and puts bums in seats in terms of tickets and whatnot and shifts units. You should just give them a short, window of opportunity a short contract three to five years give them complete carte blanche go crazy and when it ends it ends handshake and move on but obviously corporations get greedy they see the dollar signs they see the money coming in they see the sales they keep adding years on then they start to stop then, then they start to spoil the sauce and start to add their own ingredients and then there's too many chefs in the kitchen and then it all implodes but I always felt like if you've got that kind of person once a lifetime kind of artist or creative somebody that can kind of you know execute on all those different planes and smash all those fucking different verticals or whatnot they call in business just give them a short leash give them three to five years tell them they can do what they want bring whoever they want in um, support them as much as you can and then shake your hands at the end of it and continue on that probably should be the way it to go about things um but yeah let's see what happens going forward we should see the developments um it would be a really interesting and weird turn of events if he ended up going back to nike after everything that's happened with ads but i would i would i, I would anticipate if you ever did go back to Nike, I feel like Nike have learned the lesson of like how to treat Kanye and like what they've missed out on, especially given everything he produced under Adidas. And I feel like if he did ever go back to Nike, they would definitely give him more of a say so in the kind of general direction of what he's trying to do. He would get a bit more autonomy. He'd be given carte blanche. He'd be given his own monarchy, his own studio, whatever it may be. They'd definitely go out of their way to kind of make something specifically for him and then kind of let him do what he want. I think so going forward because I feel like other brands would love to have the Kanye touch imagine brands like suffering that you know the likes of Reebok and Puma and stuff they would love to have Kanye under their wing to kind of reinvent what they're doing and to breathe more to breathe new life into their products and stuff definitely for sure going forward but interesting to see um, more complaints from Kanye maybe this will go in its favor in the future we'll have to wait and see Next on the list, we've got this update courtesy of Noah featuring their full winter 22 collection. Now, I've said on here plenty of times, I think when I featured the J. Crew collection, I feel like Noah Bababdin is somewhat maybe, maybe losing the magical touch that he once had, which to me is a real shame because I've been a real big fan of Brendan. Um, I feel like um, his work that he did, especially early on in Supreme when he wasn't that well known, when he was kind of doing it behind the scenes, I feel like was some of his best work ever. Um, I still remember this anorak that I kept mentioning before and in previous shows that I had from Supreme that was maybe done in 2005, 2006. It was kind of like a fisherman's anorak that was made in kind of a wax um wax kind of finish similar to like a barber and it had these um horizontal blue and white stripes i think there was another one that had like green and navy blue but i had the blue and white stripe one that i had that obviously sold like an idiot and there was another jacket too that i had that was a fisherman's anorak that was like gray and red that i remember aaron bondorf modeling that i'm pretty sure noah was responsible for designing too so that brendan babbage was responsible for designing the um creative director behind noah and obviously the former design director over there at supreme and obviously then he went to go you know restart his brand noah and kind of put that back into prominence but the early seasons are kind of so the, the tail end of supreme around the time that he was working in and the beginning of Noah was really I think some of his key um, creative times I feel like he did some of his best work there but obviously over time as Noah's gained in popularity and output and probably investments come in and you just need to sell and shift more units do more product offerings it felt like his creativity has kind of been spread too thin and now the fact that he's taken over J. Crew, it feels like for sure he hasn't really got that much more to offer in terms of his um pov when it comes to design and when it comes to style and whatnot i felt like j crew is essentially like a budget version of noah and i feel like noah is now suffering because of the job now he's got a j crew which is pretty big in terms of reviving such a big brand and now having looked at this for winter 
22 collection is probably more of the same um, a lot of this stuff can be intertwined with the stuff that I featured before of J Crew and his first collection there's not many really interesting pieces here you've got this kind of velvet um, you know um, sleeveless you know you've got this velvet vest with a nice piece of embroidery here which is quite a nice detail but again not just in the slightest um, you've got this kind of chino look with the pinstripe shirt again classic um, Noah I love this kind of western um what you call it pattern cutting here i forgot what these things are called here on the shoulders but it's kind of a western cut with these triangles here this bucket hat's really nice actually that this model's wearing um corduroy double-breasted jacket with sweat pants with a sweatsuit i'm not into that look at all zero um there's a pretty decent look here that looks pretty nice with a striped cardigan uh what is it she put called that a burgundy and light sky blue with a nice graphic tee tucked into some nice um pleated pants which will look gray with a nice belt that's probably one of my favorite looks this look again is absolutely terrible so is the styling this kid looks like he's wearing his granddad's jacket it's like an oversized padded or somewhat very thick blazer in a tweed that kind of has interesting interesting pockets actually it's actually got the side pockets um you know that you would associate with a park or whatnot um and then it's got this really big kind of front pockets as well but again i'm not really too fond of anything here it's very frumpy looking everything here it doesn't really yeah i just don't like the, the look of it maybe it's the styling and the the background backdrop and stuff but it just doesn't look fresh it looks frumpy it looks tired it looks devoid of inspiration this look is pretty tight I'm, I'm a fan of this brown grayish type look here um this obviously classic cable knit um what you call it beanie from noah that's an absolute classic these feel really amazing in hand and from what i've read online people tend to kind of really like them because they're you know they're basically bulletproof and they can survive loads of washes um i, lo I love the addition of this uh burberry-esque jumper print here on the inside with a nice jumper with a nice scarf tucked in on the inside of the blazer that's a really nice styling tip and detail there with these kind of moccasin loafer type things going on there the addition of the white socks is not for me but i do like the overall look so that's pretty decent this this um cable knit um jumper uh cardigan thing i'm not really a fan especially with the shorts and the loafers and the shoes not for me yeah just ah, yeah some of these looks are truly horrendous this purple cardigan with the yellow shirt again it's just kind of boring this again there's a lot of golf lafleur in this sort of logo on the shorts um the loaf yeah this is a very golf lafleur look isn't it it's very tyler um yeah i'm not really a fan of any of this stuff this down jacket look with the shorts again is giving me um Amelio vibes maybe it's all the addition of the black model that definitely helps it this look is really nice i like this jacket i think i've seen this before though from noah right this kind of um multi-stripe uh thing with different kind of colors on it i'm pretty sure i've seen it before again the white socks thing Ugh, enough uh, again a jump here tucked into some shorts not for me this looks like when um, Isabella Moran was doing menswear and it was all really horrible stuff. And this kind of looks like something that she would have done. I'm not a big fan of that as well. The beret may, may be okay. Not with that shirt, not with those trousers. This look here, tonal. Again, the white socks. God damn it. They're, they're kind of allergic to having any other color sock apart from white in it. Especially when it's worn with trousers. I wonder what that's about. Everyone, yeah, I don't know. This is a pretty decent look with the navy. Yeah, that's a pretty nice. The purple hoodie here with navy written as a font in yellow with uh, the border being somewhat navy blue. That's pretty nice. I'm not really that mad at that. The hat with that flower logo is pretty nice. Um, this vest look is okay. A down vest. It looks like corduroy with some floral pants white socks again on this look with the navy chinos and work pant oh this side bag's really nice that's not even a uh, that's really big okay this is something i like this is more my look maybe so you've got a nice bomber jacket it looks like um a hoodie and again the shorts the materials and what they do on the shorts and stuff i like that's pretty that's always been quite an interesting look that that they've done right they've got these running shorts or these sports shorts whatever they have that they and they always have them in really interesting materials like a corduroy like a velour like an interesting flip on something that you definitely wouldn't see every day so that's pretty decent and then they've got this also this really cool um what would you call it messenger bag um but it looks really decent because it's a nice decent size it's bigger than what i would usually have which is kind of like a side 
satchel type bag thing so it looks more like a messenger bag maybe it's a one liter bag I'm not really too sure but this is definitely something I'd definitely be interested in getting because it could easily fit in a hoodie you can stuff that in definitely enough to fit in a couple of books some wireless headphones and whatnot that's pretty decent but again the rest of it looks a really really shabby man like what the fuck are those trousers they've got these like corduroy type trousers right with corduroy combat tr pants basically yeah not for me i'm not feeling that at all zero um again the tr yeah this is horrible some the suit's nice this is really decent there's a double breasted suit that's got a really wide leg as well that look really cool sans of shoes i'll swap the shoes out no white socks or whatnot just get some classic um loafers or some derbies and then get some black socks as well just to kind of break it up a little bit um there's a nice camoist type jacket there with orange pants decent again i've seen that kind of color combo and that styling touchdown a million times so maybe not a bigger fan of that chinos like, this is a good look actually the polo with some red sh with corduroy shorts with the white socks and the blue vans not mad at that at all it might be one of my favorites <laughs> pardon me but yeah overall not the biggest fan here there's a red hot chili peppers logo here which again similar to the golf lafleur type vibe that beanie's pretty decent in terms of a color that look is absolutely horrendous i don't know who walks around with an overcoat that size wearing shorts but hey maybe they do in new york um you got these oh, yeah this is so bad it's just inconsistent it's not it's not even that bad it's just inconsistent very patchy there's some good pieces here and there but overall, when you look at it, it just looks fucking terrible, man. Like, what are these shoes? Like, what are those? These kind of house slipper things with these light blue jeans. Like, this is, I don't know. Maybe this is what guys in Diamond Square wear. I don't really know, but this is not running over here in London. I don't I don't know about it look at all in the slightest. Do you know what I mean? Um, but this look is pretty nice again the, the suiting is always really impressive I feel like they probably are really underrated when it comes to the suiting like these double pleated pants with these whatever this whatever this thing is called on the inside here is this a gusset is this I don't know what this called when you kind of when it kind of pinches up here I like that that was incredible especially with the jumper and that beanie he was wearing up above is really nice so it's a kind of what is it, like a pinstripe grey sort of suit it looks really nice this is a pretty decent look too but overall very patchy very inconsistent and doesn't really kind of um, represent how great Noah was in the past and again maybe this is maybe a a consequence of you know brendan spreading himself too thin or maybe this is just the natural progression of brands like this like there's only so many types of these looks that you can do over the years and after a while it just you start to kind of do your own greatest hits you start to go say a few things taking more chances and stuff ends up looking a little bit patchy maybe it's just a general thing that goes about it i don't really know or maybe i'm just bugging and it is really sick and people like it but i don't really see a lot in here that's going to really get people to be willing because again the other thing as well that's disappointing here no it's also always known for having really good outerwear especially in the winter they always have really standout jackets like one or two jackets that are really standout people always want they sell out immediately um but now i just feel like maybe the bag this bag here is really impressive i really want that i'm definitely going to keep my eye on this bag this kind of messenger um over the top over the shoulders type bag going on there some of the hats are pretty decent the suits are going to be way overpriced for what they are so i'm probably not going to end up buying a suit i think they're like 600 dollars or something like that right so they're pretty crazy for a suit you'd probably be better off just buying an actual suit from a suit company than buying a suit from a quasi streetwear company for 600 pounds just doesn't make any sense to me personally but again maybe i'm in the minority there but apart from that and a couple of other looks like this polo is pretty decent um it's all pretty mediocre for me but again maybe i'm bugging out and you guys think differently let me know in the comments down below if you do um and then we're going to switch over to another collection that i want to check out which is for the brand aries arise aries arise aries um founded by somebody that was involved with palace and i think their partner i'm, I'm pretty sure right it's uh what's his first what's his name um fergus is it is it fergus um let me see did, did they put his name on there is his name fergus that does um fucking i don't know doesn't matter uk brand very highly rated um over the last few years running on from strength to strength i still kick myself over not getting the fucking um, new balance calibration that they put out a few years ago no a couple of years ago um in two colorways really really 
great shoes. Again, it's really encouraging too because I see way more people wearing the um, Aries New Balance shoes out and about as like regular everyday beaters. A lot of those people look like they're kind of creative types anyway or they might have gotten them for free but still they look sick on in real life and it's always a really good credit. I feel like if you're a designer of that level and no one's just, they're not just reselling your shoes but they're actually wearing them similar to like the Tom Sachs Miles Yards and stuff, right? It's probably a good... Um, review or critique of your shoes that people are wearing them and beating them into the ground like i did in my shoes and stuff so yeah aries full winter 2022 collection 61 looks it's a lot of looks in it oh i like this immediately look number one with the new balances featured looks absolutely incredible you got this um african type print uh you know that you would see from you know people selling in Dorsal Market with Aries written all over it and then you've got this suit jacket on top which is probably something that I would probably throw away but still I love the entire suit I'd probably wear that head to toe straight away continuing on you've got this Jadore Aries top with women's jeans that looks all right and decent the styling and the um, selection of models was casting sorry is always decent and good um, great use of tie dye as per usual they got these pieces of underwear too with Aries written on the waistband which is pretty neat a nice um uh, what you call it a nice turtleneck jumper they got the classic no problemo jump sweatshirt here I guess in women's it's got these kind of um puffy shoulders and the no problem is, is a sort of diamante and again king of the tie-dye so that looks oh that's incredible yeah that suit is so nice so it's a tie-dye suit uh with flared uh pants and this kind of cropped um small jumper this one looks incredible on men's too to be honest it's always unisex anyway if i'm not mistaken areas that don't have men's or women's all kind of fluid so you can kind of put you know as long as you can fit your ass into it you're fine I'm not sure. Are these are these um Uggs? Okay, maybe they do Uggs calibration. Okay, yeah, classic. No problem. With sweatsuits again. They got going on there with the scarf on top, a nice jumper with the hat on top as well with the logo. Oh, this tie dye down sort of outfit is absolutely incredible in flames. Really, really nice looking there. I love the look of that. Not a collaborate. I think that's all done in house as well, so it's not collaboration with fucking um, North Face or anything. These bottoms are so good. I'm sure a lot of girls are going to be into them. I think who was wearing those type of like exaggerated massive combat, but maybe it was Kim. She had his, there was this brand that does these sort of like you know small waist, big legs sort of combat pants sort of type of things that girls like to wear with heels, so they look pretty cool. Um, there's a balaclava type jumper. Is that connected to the jumper? Or is that additional on top? Maybe it's on top with the hood on it. That looks pretty sick. Uh, again, that jacket in that similar sort of tone colorway, that kind of over dyed purple um, or lilac. It looks pretty sick. I got a, uh, a snapback hat here that says Raw, which says Rock Aries Aries Worldwide. I like that. Not, not not mad at that. New logo, a new branding they're probably putting out. That's really tight to see. The denim suit is really classic as well classic london classic uk classic garage vibes oh this look is so hard jesus christ some of the stuff in here that i want <laughs> this looks really fucking sick holy shit this looks really good whatever that sweatshirt is is that mohair or that jumper is that mohair do you reckon that beanie is really hard as well the styling on this is really good. Whoever's doing the styling at Aries, take a, take a round of applause, uh, pat on the back, high five, spud. You are absolutely smashing it, um, whoever you are. Again, just great stuff all around. Great scarf. I'm going to quickly scan through this. I don't want to waste too much of your time on this. But yeah, it all looks absolutely superb. The combat jean things look great. This dress looks amazing. Loads of stuff that you can copy your girl if you're that way inclined. Do you know what I mean? If you want to get her some cool stuff, this suit is really nice. It's a relaxed suit, isn't it? Oh, it's got elasticated waistband with the blazer. Or maybe that's a different. Maybe the. That would be interesting if they made suit trousers with elasticated waistband that are really relaxed. I wonder if they are. If these are just sweatpants that have been mixed with a suit jacket. I don't really know. But they look really cool. I like that entire look. I'd wear the hell out of that straight away. Um, a great look here also like a little twist on the dicky sort of hoodie thing I like that logo on the hat with just a classic A on there that looks really cool I'm not I'm not mad at that and yeah just everything looks really nice man they've got big cowboy boots there um, whatever that is I like this also wow it looks really really good I'm going to put the link actually in the show notes so you can check out yourself and flick through so I'm not kind of boring you with these videos if you're not watching this it's pretty average to see all this type of stuff but oh this cardigan is really nice with a football helmet in the back hell witch written on the helmet 
again with these um what do they call them areas always do a really good version of this whether a fleece these sort of like you know um sleeveless fleece or the fleeces in general they do really good um versions of these season in season out so that's not surprising or oh, there's a great varsity jacket with the raw written on the back of it also the wash of the jeans is always incredible really good oh even look how big the back pockets are i wonder if these are definitely based on a really old pair of jeans in it because that style is really something you don't see too often how it bellows out there on the waist and has these massive back pockets that's really cool again a nice suit or jacket i think there's a bag there too denim jacket there's a nice little belt there also with the aries written on it all good 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 shit man you can't be mad at any of this stuff it's all amazing it all looks great um as per usual um and again check it out if you're that way inclined in it aries for winter 2022 will be out i think probably relatively soon in it but yeah i love i love all of it to be honest i'm a big fan of everything that they put out and again for me it's a quintessential london brand for the most part i see these clothes and i can immediately see people that i've known in yesteryears wearing them it immediately collects with my upbringing and my interest and all that stuff oh look at how hard this shit is what is that is that a newsprint um suit what is that Oh, it's all prints of like Jesus Christ and shit. Is that taken from like postcards? I'm not really too sure, but it looks really sick. It looks like all these really weird um, Catholic images of like Jesus Christ. I wonder if these shoes are going to come back out again. If they're going to re release a new balance. They're just trying to tease us with them anyway, but they look so nice. I really regret not getting a pair, man. Damn, damn, damn. But yeah, Aries Fall Winter 2022 will be available when? When this is in our Hypebeast article. They'll be available. It's available to buy now. So check it out if you're that way inclined. Check it out if you're that way inclined. Who's someone said his started here? Take us a look at the Claire who Claire Sh Claire Shieldland shot lookbook. Okay, Claire Shieldland shot it. But I don't know who took this. Who did the styling? Whoever did do the styling, you smashed it. Well done and congrats. Anyway. That was the episode number 597. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. I'm going to end the show now because I've got to prepare for a stream. But thank you so much for tuning in. If it's the first time checking out the show, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. And of course, if you want to support any other bits and pieces concerning me, you know where to go at www.xnzinger.com. And I'll have more content for you and more shows coming up this week, of course. So please keep an eye out. Until then, peace peace oh yeah if you listen to the audio podcast you'll hear a tune if you're watching the video it'll just go to black as per usual so take care people peace